to know the truth and the truth will set you free the truth is the word of God the Bible the truth is Jesus himself who came to save you and me thank you and God bless you okay um the program we'll just go straight to the questions and hopefully we're going through the questions um, okay Doctor. These are for right okay who's going first okay. um, the first question is to Dr. Shorosh okay if you're ready <laughs> sure um, can you please tell me what tell me Tell me why you are not addressing Shabir at these points and instead you are, leading your pa you are reading your papers prepared before the debate. I thought we were told not to clap or make noises or sounds and so forth. You're not listening very well. But be that as it may, you can just enjoy yourself. That's fine. My response is I ignore what he has presented because I don't believe in what he said. I simply overlook it and present the truth. For the battle is for the truth. We're not just having mental di discussions. We're not just having scholarly discussion. You know, he can present his case. I can present my case. But I'm presenting you the truth of the word of God. Now, if I believe in what he says, I would probably go on and do that. If I don't believe it, I just ignore it. And as far as I'm concerned, I appreciate his intelligence and his dedication and his hard work. But I just don't believe in what he's saying. So I present to you what I believe in what I'm saying. And you have the choice. It is not a matter of polemics and circular reasoning that he tries to use and this scholar and that scholar. Ladies and gentlemen, knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. I love you and I want to share with you the truth. That's my privilege. That's my honor. Thank you. Okay, I thought I made it kind of clear during the speakers are speaking. Please no comments and clapping and things like that, all respect to the speakers, uh, we agree with them, <laughs> yeah, agree with them or disagree with them, I think we should have show respect to both speakers, thank you. Um, question, next question is Dr. Sh to Shabir, um, from your discussion it seems as if you are quite happy to use textual and historical criticism regarding the Bible, would you recommend us any, bo any books on textual criticism on the Quran? Uh, yes, there have been several excellent books uh, written uh, by Muslims and by non-Muslims on the uh, textual study of the Quran. In Arabic, there is Al uh, Khan Fi Ulum Al Quran by Alama Suyuti. Uh, by uh, there is also uh, uh, several others along the same line in, in the Arabic language. In the English language, we have uh, a few books done. One by Ahmad von Denver, which is a smaller book. Uh, a, a, a more recent book has been done by uh, Sheikh Abu Amina Bilal Phillips and uh, there is one, an excellent one done by Mufti Taki Usmani from Pakistan that's translated into English and uh, also there is uh, a book recently uh, produced by Muhammad Mustafa Al-Azimi, The History of the Text of the Quran. Uh, I think this is the most uh, excellent of all of these uh, works and that's a good starting point for getting a good grasp of how the text of the Quran has been transmitted and preserved both in memory and in writing over time so that we can have the assurance that the uh, Quran we're reading today is the word of God that has been preserved as God has promised in his text. Inna nahna nazalna dhikra wa inna lahu uh, We have uh, uh, revealed the, uh, the message, the reminder, and we are surely going to uh, preserve it. So we can see today that uh, the same kinds of uh, scholarly work that has been gone into the Bible has been gone into the Quran as well. And uh, from the non-Muslim side, there are some scholars who have worked on this. For example, there is a scholar, Arthur Jeffrey, who did uh, an excellent uh, uh, edition of the Kitab al-Masahif by the son of Abu Dawood, the famed uh, collector of one of the Sunan works. And uh, his introduction to that uh, is also worth uh, studying. However, many have found that uh, this uh, writing of Arthur Jeffrey uh, does not in fact uh, do justice to the history of the Quranic text as it was known. He has tried to compile from all of the 
uh, the Sira and the, and the Tafsir works, any mention that there has been a variant reading by someone else, and he has compiled all of those and given them equal weight. But I think uh, Muhammad Mustafa Azmi has uh, responded to some of the points that Arthur Jeffrey has made, but that book is also uh, worth uh, reading. Finally, we should say something about uh, using uh, the scholarship. When we look at what scholars have written, we do not look at uh, what they have said because they are scholars, because a scholar may be right, a scholar may be wrong, but we look at the evidence and proof based on which uh, they have formed their conclusions, and we examine that evidence and proof and see if we might form the same conclusion. We might uh, get a quick feel of the field by looking at what scholars have said, but that does not uh, settle the issue. In my presentation tonight, in dealing with the gospel material, you will recall that I uh, in, did not depend on the scholars, but I showed you specific examples where the story about Jesus has evolved over time and has been changed in order to make it look more assuredly that Jesus had died and more assuredly that Jesus had resurrected back to life. And when we see this kind of protest from within the Gospels, we realize that we should uh, treat it as that and have our own conclusions than the conclusions that the Gospels themselves are trying to portray to us. Thank you. Next question to Dr. Shosh. If Jesus was the Son of God, would God sit back and allow the crucifixion of his Son without interfering? The entire purpose of Jesus Christ, as I shared with you this afternoon, if you were listening, was he was to be killed in our behalf, to lay his life as the greatest proof of God's love for us, and then rise again. In every gospel it stays there. Please remember that the scripture is written by eyewitnesses or people who talk with the eyewitnesses. As for my good friend Shabir, how in the world can he judge 2,000 years after the fact what is a part of the Old Testament or New Testament or part of the Gospels or this that added or developed or all that? How can he do that? We removed by 2,000 years and the record we have is accurate. We'll be dealing tomorrow with the Bible and Jesus versus Muhammad and the Quran. And I will share with you some more things concerning that. But for the moment, please remember that God did not interfere in the crucifixion because he had planned it from the foundation of the earth. The Bible tells us that Jesus was the Lamb of God slain from the foundation of the earth. And in the first prophecy, he told us, as I read to you, that he, the son of the woman, not the man, the virgin birth, predicted at the beginning of creation that he would be the one who will crush the serpent's head conquering death with death although the serpent will only bruise his heel so his death was a bruise and that's why he rose the resurrection of Christ is not only proven by the scripture by history but by changed lives of murderers of thieves of alcoholics of abusers who are transformed by the power of Jesus so the life of Christ through the Holy Spirit can live in them and they can shine for the Lord for the fruit of the Spirit is love joy peace long-suffering gentleness kindness meekness faithfulness self-control that you cannot come up with without the Spirit of God working in your life and I'm grateful to say that Jesus fulfilled the will of God that's why the last thing he said on the cross was it is finished it's completed the plan of God for the salvation of humanity is totally completed and then he said into thy hands I give what my spirit because he is also spirit Jesus is both perfect man perfect God thank you thank you next question to brother Shapiro it says please explain Please explain what the Quran means by Allah raising Jesus to himself because if Allah raised him in the physical form then who was buried in the grave and if Allah raised Jesus Jesus spirit to himself then how then how could he stay alive without his spirit Of course, if Allah raised him in a physical form, then uh, the question doesn't hold. The question is asking how could he stay alive without the spirit. Of course, if Allah raised him in a spiritual form, then he is alive as a spirit. Uh, but uh, I think your question more uh, to the point is probably if Allah raised him as a spirit, what happened to his body? 
but that assumes that the tomb was empty and the reports about it are accurate. But in fact, scholars who have worked back on this, uh, they have reasonable assurance that in fact the t story about the empty tomb is a later development. The first pro proclamation about Jesus being alive was about a spiritual proclamation, as we find in, in Paul's writing. Uh, Paul believed in a spiritual resurrection. But later on, people want to flesh this out, because if you just preach a spiritual resurrection, then people may not believe you. How do you mean that he was resurrected as a spirit? Uh, so you want to prove that he really resurrected as flesh and blood. So then the tomb has to be empty. And so the story develops over time. And this has been admitted by Raymond Brown in his massive two-volume commentary, part of the Anchor Bible series, a uh, commentary on the Gospel according to John. Now, uh, Dr. Shirosh is asking us, how can we know that this is the, the case? How can we know that things like this uh, happened, that the Gospels developed over time and so on? Well, by a simple comparison. Scholars study and they look at uh, the similarity of wording, they look at uh, what has been borrowed from what has been copied. It's like a professor receiving two assignments uh, from two different students and seeing that there is a verbal uh, resemblance between the two. Uh, naturally, some degree of copying will be suspected. And if that uh, verbal correspondence continues throughout the page, well, then we know for sure that this has been the case. And then when we see that uh, there have been not only verbal correspondences which uh, show undeniably that copying has taken place, we see also changes where we know also that there are deliberate reasons for, for changing. And we try to find out what the, each author was trying to do. This is an entire field of study that has taken hundreds of years and have developed to a a certain level of confidence now, we can be quite sure now that Matthew and Luke were reworking from, God, John's, from uh, Mark's gospel and they have changed the story. Matthew has invented things such as the story about the, uh, the, the saints coming back to life. And what Matthew has done here is quite curious because he says that when Jesus died, the saints came back to life. And then he says, after the resurrection, they came out of the tombs and appeared to the people in the city. So Matthew has it there that they came back to life and were remaining in their tombs for the next day and a half. Now why did Matthew do it this way? Why didn't they just come out immediately? Because Matthew wants them that Jesus should be the first to resurrect, meaning to come out of the tomb. Let the saints come out afterwards. But Matthew also wants for the saints to come back to life at the cosmic moment when Jesus actually dies. So he has it both ways. They come back to life when Jesus dies, but they don't come out of their graves until after Jesus. So Matthew has his cake and also eats it. But if all of these dead saints came and walked around in the city of Jerusalem, that would be big news. And it will be in all of the Gospels, but nobody else seems to have known about this. And scholars agree now that this is an invention from Matthew. Thank you. Um, the next question, Dr. Shiro says, you, you quoted John 19 to prove he was an eyewitness. eyewitness and wrote the gospel according to John. Please explain therefore the following pronouns. John 19.35 It says, And he that saw it bear, uh, it bear record, and his record is true, and he knows that he saith true, that you might believe. And in John 21.24 Who are we, in verse commas, who say that know that his testimony is true? First of all, my challenging Shabir, the Quran says Jesus raised the dead, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Okay, so if Jesus raised the dead, why do you doubt the rising of the other dead? I'd like to know. Thank you. Okay. The other interesting thing is, as to scholarship, let's talk about scholarship. Ladies and gentlemen, I am yet to see a Bible he can bring to me or anybody can bring to me that shows me that the Bible we have in our hand, in our hand has been developed and changed from the Bibles that we have throughout history. We have 25,000 copies in museums all over the world. And why would we change all of that? From the beginning, ladies and gentlemen, these were eyewitnesses. Matthew wrote from the view that Jesus is from the line of David, so he presented him to the Jews as the king. And so he relates all of that. Mark presented the gospel to the Romans. Soldiers, fast, going, moving. That's why it is so short. That's why it is immediately, immediately, immediately. Luke presented the gospel as a compassionate person who Jesus was and gives you more details about the miracles because he was a doctor and gave you the details how those miracles take place. Well, I challenge my friend to show me anywhere in the Quran where he ever shows us, where the Quran ever shows us how Jesus raised the dead, how Jesus gave the sight to the blind, although it says he did this, he did that. 
My suggestion is, you look back to the true record. The Quran is borrowed from the Bible, plagiarized from the Bible. And I challenge you to find the truth. Not a copy, not an interpretation of Muhammad of the Old and New Testament. Find the scripture and rejoice in the truth that God really came in the person of Jesus to say, I love you, I want to save you, to change your life, I want to bless your life, I want to give you eternal life, and my purpose is to bless you and make you a blessing. Now, as for the question about the record of John, it's very simple. Here it is. One of the methods of writing, and I do that, I've written 10 books, is to use a third person. Secondly, it's humility. Thirdly, when you read in the book, he calls himself the beloved disciple. He is so humble about the way God has worked in his life, he trying to shy away as if to promote himself. This is why he says at the end, the one who saw this, he is giving his personal testimony, writing this for you, for me, because through this, you can believe an eyewitness, not a second report, not 600 years later after the fact, but an eyewitness of all that happened and all that Jesus did and said. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you, Dr. Shabir. Next question Dr. Sh uh, to Brother Shabir. It says, Jesus prophesies in the Quran, Blessed is the day I die and raise again. Is Shabir trying to, to, to defunct this verse of the Quran and how and how he can stay, how can, how can he stay a Muslim by trying to do so? Moreover, are you in a disagreement with those Islamic scholars who believe that Jesus died for a few hours and then was raised to Allah? Well, first of all, I accept the verse of the Quran, every verse of the Quran. And uh, I've explained that this verse of the Quran does not prove that Jesus actually died in the past. Uh, when Jesus said this, he was alive, and he said that at some future point he will die and he will be resurrected to life. So whether that future point already occurred in our history or will occur in our future, that uh, is something that Muslim scholars can still discuss and even differ about. The idea that Jesus died for several hours and then uh, uh, God uh, took him up uh, alive uh, that was reported by Wahab bin Munabba it is an opinion that was given as an explanation of a Quranic verse it is not a binding opinion on all Muslims in fact there's several opinions from several different scholars you cannot believe in all of them but you weigh them, you sift them, you try to see which are the best opinions and then you hold those and Muslims can have different opinions about things which are not essential to our belief and what it precisely happened with Jesus in the end is not an essential item in our belief. It is essential to believe in every verse in the Quran uh, but it is not essential to believe in every interpretation of every verse of the Quran. Now, as to uh, Dr. Shirosh's question, why would I believe in, uh, that God can resurrect someone and not believe in Matthew's depiction of that resurrection? Well, the fact that God resurrects people does not mean that God resurrected every person who has ever been claimed to have been resurrected from the dead in the past. So, it, yes, we believe it, that God resurrects uh, people from the dead, but uh, hardly anyone today believes uh, in, in what Matthew has written here. This is oh, Matthew's own apology. Uh, and uh, Christian biblical scholars, as I've mentioned, Dr. William Lane Craig, if you think he's not a good scholar, tell us so. Uh, he has said that hardly any um, scholar of the Gospels would believe Matthew's uh, story today. Uh, they think this is Matthew's invention. Is the Quran copied from the Bible? No. I have said previously, and Dr. Shirosh uh, uh, has not responded to what I've asked for. Show us an example where the Quran has actually, as he says, plagiarized the Bible. What I will show you, in fact, uh, is that the Quran improves the on the Bible. For example, you have uh, the story of uh, Mary uh, and the Annunciation to Mary. What does the Gospel of Luke say? The Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power, the power of, the, uh, of God will, will come upon you. The power of the Mighty One will come upon you and the Holy Spirit will overshadow you and so what will be born in you will be called Son of the Holy Spirit. Well, this makes it appear that the Holy Spirit or God is taking the place of the husband for Mary. But the Quran puts it nicely. Uh, when Mary asks, how can I have a child when no mortal has touched me? The Quran says, uh, that is easy for God. Whenever he decrees the thing, he only says to it be, and it becomes. So it, it is quite uh, a different narrative in, in the Quran. You can see that the sexual imagery has been greatly reduced, and the Quran then proves itself more to be a worthy book to guarantee the development of uh, human spirituality. So finally, I think the 
The question boils down to, should we believe in the Quranic narrative even though it comes uh, 600 years later? I think so. The Quran is a, a book that brings the same spiritual message of Jesus, but in a form that guarantees uh, a, a better spiritual development. And I thank you very much. Okay, this is the last set of questions for each guest. And it says here, why would Jesus, if he is, he, he is of, of the same essence, nature of God, i.e. the Son of God, cry out to God, why hast thou forsaken me? Is the sin of God so weak? Why is, why is he complaining about his fate and his God? Thank you. Tomorrow I'll be sharing with you about your challenge. And how much the of the Bible has been borrowed in the Quran. And I think you'll be excited. I will be, yes. Be <laughs> Nevertheless, we are looking at a mystery. Jesus was a complete man, complete God. At one time, because of the fact that a little bit of what he is and what he was in the garden, you shared that with us last night, the whole crowd coming to arrest him fell backward. Another time on the mountain, the disciples fell on their faces. He was clothed in human flesh. On the cross he cried out because number one, he was fulfilling a prophecy that I read to you from chapter from Psalms 22, the hymn book of the Jews. My God, my God, what have you forsaken me? The rest of that Psalm I read to you this afternoon, if you were listening, was an explanation of the suffering of Jesus for you and for me. So he was fulfilling that. Third, the word of God explains enough for us to see a glimpse of the justice of God on the cross because without shedding of blood there is no remission of sin Jesus who knew no sin became sin for us so on the cross you see the justice of God in that Jesus was our redeemer our substitute he took your place he took my place if you owed a million dollars a million pounds and you don't have it a French friend rich friend comes and pays your debt you're free the debt that you and I owe is death that's why Jesus, the second Adam, the perfect Adam, the first Adam fought in the garden and lost, the second Adam fought in the garden of Gethsemane and won, and he took your place. That's why the scripture, the, 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 the Quran says, Shubbi halahum. He looked like them. He took their place. He took their shape. He took their sin. He took their burden. That's why on the cross, as a result, God Almighty, who cannot look at sin, turned his face, so to speak. A mystery that one day we can understand in glory. But the fact is Jesus felt a momentary separation between him and the Father. That's why he cried out, Father, forgive them. He was interceding for you, interceding for me. He was not a weakling. He calmed the waves. He walked on the water. Here is the dead. He gave sight to the blind. You can't call a person weakling, can you? Muhammad never performed a miracle, but Jesus performed 40. Thank you. The final question tonight goes to Dr. Shabir. Um, if God forgives us easily without redemption, Sorry. if God forgives us easily without redemption, so his mercy is contradicting, contradiction to his justice, explain. No, Muslims do not see a, a contradiction between the mercy and the justice of God. If God punishes people, then he is just for, in the punishment that he gives. But if he wants to forgive, he can forgive because there's no authority over him insisting that he must punish the people who sin. So we see this in the teachings of uh, Jesus, for example, in the Gospel according to Luke, in the story of the prodigal son. What did Jesus teach by that? Jesus taught that if you turn back, God will forgive you just like the father forgave his son. Uh, and and there is, in that case, no need for anyone to pay for your sins. If somebody stands in your place, that means you go free. If Jesus stood in our place, it means we should all go free. If God turns around and penalizes us as well because we are sinful or because we do not repent, that means he will claim the price of the sin twice. That will be unjust. So I do not believe here that Dr. Shirosh has given us a solution to the sin problem. Now, Dr. Shirosh uh, has asked us, you know, how do we know that the Bible has been corrupted? There's so many 2,500 manuscripts, or uh, actually 5,300 of the New Testament. Dr. Shirosh, can I borrow you a copy of the Bible here? Do, do you mind if I just... You have your own. Can I just have a look at yours? Don't you have one? I just need yours. <laughs> Thank you very much. On me. You have the authentic Bible, Dr. Shirosh. 
Now, this is the New King James Version of the Bible. It contains 1 John chapter 5, verse 7. You're aware of that? You bring that story again. You're aware of that. And you're aware that you have already said in the previous debate that that is a later insertion into the Bible. Why are you carrying a Bible that has a verse that is a forgery? One verse out of tens of thousands. But you admit at least one verse that is a forgery. It's not a forgery. And there are Bibles which do not contain that verse. I have them. He could carry those. But he carries the Bible which has the verse which says that there are three in heaven and these three are one because that's a beloved verse. It's hard to part with it. You carry that verse and yet you ask us where is there a forgery in the Bible? There it is, Dr. Shirosh. It, it is right there. Tomorrow. <laughs> we will see. Now, Dr. Shirosh uh, wants to prove that the Quran has been borrowed from previous uh, uh, material. And of course, Muslims will have to have the patience tomorrow to sit and listen to him. But you can have the assurance that I will be prepared to deal with uh, his claims. And in fact, uh, he should be prepared to listen to my response uh, as well. Uh, we have shown so far, folks, that uh, it is the Christian obligation to prove that uh, Jesus died. And Dr. Shirosh has not actually given us any proof outside of the Bible, anything that reasonable people can believe in. And uh, it is uh, the obligation also to prove that Jesus rose from the dead. And he has not actually proven that uh, as a historical fact. Dr. Shirosh's references to Old Testament prophecies about Jesus should be understood uh, in the light of what Randall Helms has written in his book entitled Gospel Fictions. The New Gospel material was written in order to justify the prophecies, to say that Jesus fulfilled all of the prophecies. If they didn't write it the way it occurred in history, they wrote it the way they read it in the prophecy. So they read the prophecy into the life of Jesus and then wrote that as history after the fact because they wanted to match the prophecy. So you cannot then turn the logic around and say that Jesus fulfilled the prophecy. You, you have to understand that the material was written in such a way to forge it so that you prove that Jesus fulfilled the prophecy by the very writing. I thank you all very much. Thank you. Okay, there we conclude. And